God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Hello again. Thank you for joining us and welcome to Online Church. My name is Jimmy and I'll be your host and presenter today as we go through part seven of the Origins series, God's Whole Person Wellness Plan. Today we'll be talking about something very interesting and I'm sure a lot of you will be excited to know about the Fountain of Youth activity, the Fountain of Youth. Before we begin, let us bow our heads and say a word of prayer. Dear Father in Heaven, Lord, as we come before you now, we just want to ask that you bless this time that we have together, that as we learn from the science and from your Bible, that Lord, we might be able to um, l- uh, understand the blessing that you wish to give us, and Lord, help us to know how to apply this to our personal lives, and also how we can share this with those we love, that Lord, uh, the blessing might not be just for ourselves only, but also for our family and for our friends. We ask all of this in your Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. So um, today we're looking at activity, the fountain of youth. Now, what's, um, this talk, um, just to make it uh, more palatable, I've broken it up into two parts. But both talks this week and next week, we'll be talking about the fountain of youth. And so we're just going to begin by having a look at this picture. So here we've got two um, male underwear models. And I just want you to have a guess of their age. If you've had a good look, okay. So the person on the right, um, some of you may recognize, he's a famous Hollywood star, and this is before he became famous. Um, He was, uh, Mark Wahlberg was at that point in time a Calvin Klein model. That's how he started off his uh, uh, trek to becoming famous, and he was age 21 at the time. Um, what What I think is quite incredible is the physique of the gentleman next door, who actually isn't a male model. He's actually a psychiatrist, a doctor. Um, His name is John Turner and this photo was taken when he was age 67. Here's another photo. Um, Have a guess of the age of this lady. Can you guess? Well, they're not boyfriend and girlfriend. In fact, it's mum and son and that lady is 49 years old. And so with that in mind, we're going to begin talking about this talk about the fountain of youth. You know, skin is probably one of the most visible aspects of aging. And so with that in mind, we're going to have a look, talk about this substance called ceramides. Now, this is a waxy substance our skin normally makes, um, and it's decreased in those with certain skin diseases, particularly things like eczema and psoriasis. And the function of ceramides, are, and it, there's a, 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 a number of different uh, molecule, uh, molecules that are all classed as ceramides, uh, the, their function is to help trap moisture in the skin. And science is finding out a whole lot more that this does. And it's used in some of the top anti-aging creams um, that's available in the cosmetics industry. Now, what's really interesting to know is the cost. Um, it was mind-boggling when a drug rep actually told me. So last week when I checked the price of gold in Australian dollars was about $76 Australian per gram. Um, Per gram, how much do you think the ceramides cost? It in fact costs much more than gold, in excess of $1,000 Australian AUD per gram. That's crazy, in excess of 1,000 AUD per gram. Now, for both Mr. John Turner and Ye Lin Liu, he's the mum there on the right, um, what do you think they use as their anti-aging product? You know, what sort of um, skin product do you think they use? And if you could access this, if you could uh, buy their skin product, their anti-aging uh, product, how much are you willing to pay for this product? Well, I'll share with you the secret. Um, the cost is 30 to 60 minutes per day. And the product is this. It's exercise. You know, John Turner, the psychiatrist, was a keen 
uh, weights workout person. And he would regularly, uh, multiple times a week, do weight training. And he, it was his hobby. He did it from young. And so he kept it up. And so um, th that's how we managed to maintain such an excellent physique, even at age 67, you know, comparable to Mark Warburg when he was 21. Ye Lin Liu, um, this lady, um, every day would go swimming in lakes and then follow that up with a weight training um, program that she would do every day. So um, that is the secret to staying look and looking young. You know, and as we look at the Bible, as we um, heard before, as we read the Bible in Genesis 2.15, um, you know, this is God's ideal for us. You know, we read, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And this was before sin came into existence. What's really interesting is that, and so God intended us to, you know, to work in gardens, to be active. This was our first job. And what's really interesting is that after sin came about into existence, um, God's instructions to us didn't change. You know, we read in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, Then to Adam, he, God, said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I have commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. After the fall, um, God's recommendation for mankind was to increase exercise, to do more of it. Um, so physical activity is good for us. As God puts it, it was for our sakes that he made our jobs a little bit more toilsome. For our sake. And so the Bible is clear. We were made for movement. We were made for activity. And particularly, um, it was for tending and keeping garden, and then obviously for growing food and all of that. So apart from skin, are there any other health benefits for physical activity? Well, we're going to focus on skin. Sorry, we're going to focus on skin a little bit more. Um, so um, skin... A bit of background um, is made up of multiple layers, but there are two key layers. The first layer is the outermost layer, um, and this is what we call the stratum corneum, and it's mainly used for waterproofing and keeping in moisture. So it prevents outside moisture from coming in and keeps our inside moisture within us. And the next, a couple, um, there's a few other microscopic layers, but then the next biggest layer that we come across is what we call the stratum spinosum. And this is important because this is what gives skin its stretch and its strength, so that when you try to pull skin apart, it doesn't just split and come apart, but it's stretchy. And this is a part also that young skin tends to have. Now, um, looking at skin, um, a professor, Mark Tanopolsky from the McMaster's University in Ontario, um, did this really interesting exercise experiment. Um, that, and this was reported a few years back in the New York Times. And what he did was he wanted to check the difference in the quality of skin between those who were sedentary, so he didn't, those who didn't do much exercise, and those who were active. And he looked at those who were young and sedentary, young and active, old and sedentary, old and active. Um, and this is what he found, that across the board, um, that those who were um, sedentary had... Um, and so this is just comparing activity, those who did greater than four hours per week of activity versus those who were sedentary. So they did less than one hour per week. And um, what is really interesting to note here is that the the thicker layer, the, the waterproofing is thicker in those who don't move around much. Uh, but at the same time, the stratum spinosum, so the part that's in um, that gives skin its incredible strength and flexibility, that that is thicker in those who are more active. Now, what's also really interesting is that he then posed the question. So, look, what if, you know, I'm only hearing this uh, new research now and I'm already 65. Have I missed the boat? I'm all wrinkly already. Have I missed the boat? And so what he then did was he got a, uh, within his group of research people, he screened them all out and took all the over 65s who were sedentary. And then he gave them three months to get into shape and be active in those three months. 
and after those three months, he redid skin biopsies for each of those previously sedentary people who were over 65 who were now active. And what's really encouraging to note is that, um, and this is where we want to look at the third uh, bar on here and see um, that their collagen content, um, and this is helps. This is the protein that helps give skin its young feel. It actually increased after exercise, and it um, and he describes it in his paper as the increase to being equivalent to those older people losing ten to 15 years of age from a skin perspective. Wow, incredible. And so this is a quote we get from the New York Times. Under a microscope, the volunteer's skin, that's the older than 65 who was previously sedentary, but then he then decided to take up three months of, acti uh, of ac exercising activity. Their skin looked like that of a much younger person and all they had done differently was exercise. Does exercise do anything else apart from skin? Um, here is a study looking at that. It's uh, looking particularly at fitness and cardiovascular or exercise and cardiovascular disease. And it's called the Aerobic Center Longitudinal Study. A huge study looked at lots of people, uh, lots of men, lots of women. And it was followed up over many years, over eight years. And what it found was that those who were unfit, so people who were classified as low fit men, uh, they had a 2.7 times, so greater than two and a half times risk of dying from heart disease and cardiovascular disease compared to the most fit group within the same cohort. Um, for low fit women, um, they were had an even higher risk of uh, dying from cardiovascular disease compared to fit women. Um, and another study found that physical activity or rather low fitness um, is the strongest predictor of overall mortality and that a high fit person with any two of smoking, high blood pressure or high cholesterol had less chance of dying than a low fit person. Now that's really incredible because smoking, high blood pressure and high cholesterol are risk factors strongly associated with multiple chronic diseases like heart disease and stroke um, and and these things we know increases the death rate the mortality rate uh, but this study found that um, if you are fit and you even if you had two of those you're better off than a non-fit person let me phrase it a different way for you if you don't exercise and that's all you don't do but you're otherwise healthy then a smoker with high blood pressure who is fit is better off than you that's right a smoker with high blood pressure but because they are fit because they exercise they're better off than a person who is otherwise fit and healthy but doesn't exercise quite a quite a, you know really powerful research here Here's another really incredible um, uh, research, and this came out a little while back. Um, what this group of people did was they looked at all people who had stable heart disease. In other words, they had known plaques uh, or they had known narrowings in their arteries in their heart uh, when they had an angiogram done at baseline. And they were, that was all done because they all had chest pains when they exercised. So they found all these people with chest pain when they exercised. They did all, all of them had angiograms and all of them had proven narrowing to one um, artery in their heart. And then what they did was that they randomly assigned half to have the normal best medical practice procedure to fix that. Um, and that's having a stent done. And so the narrowing was quite significant, as you can see from the diagram. The other half... What they did for them was they just said, okay, you don't get the stand, we just help you exercise. And so they got taught how to do that over an initial two week program in hospital and then uh, or very quite intensively. And then after that, they were it was maintained at a 20 minute stationary bike ride at 70% of their heart rate, 70% um, um, of the heart rate needed to trigger their angina. And they would do this um, every single day uh, with a once a week group session as well. All of them had the same optimal heart medication that is uh, that it was uh, the best practice um, at that point in time. 
So the only difference was that half had a stent and the others were just told to have exercise and were shown how to do it. This is the outcome 12 months later. Those who exercise had an 88 event free survival, whereas those who had the stent only had a 70% event free survival. Um, and so in absolute numbers, what that meant was that the um, exercise group um, had um, an 18% uh, better outcome um, in absolute numbers compared to the stent group. And so what I mean by event-free survival is that they didn't have any uh, heart attacks, they didn't have a stroke or uh, a mini stroke, they didn't need, uh, they weren't subsequently needing a stent um, or open heart surgery uh, or, or any such things. And so that's incredible. You know, as doctors, you know, we are taught that um, where it's appropriate, stenting is best practice. And certainly based on the indications in this research, it would have been appropriate to stent them. Uh, but what we're finding here is that there's something superior to stenting, exercise. Not only did it help them from a heart perspective, uh, but obviously the group that exercised also became fitter. And so they had a um, they had better resting heart rate and they had a better VO2 max. And that's something that I'll explain later, but that's really important from a health perspective. The exercise group not um, also um, did better than the stent group from a exercise tolerance perspective. In other words, um, the distance and the amount of exertion that the group that did the exercise training did before they triggered their chest pains. Because, you know, they didn't have a stent. So they still would get chest pains when they exercise. But what they found was that they could do greater, more, further um, than what they could previously. And in fact, not only more than what they could do previously, but they could actually walk further, exert themselves harder compared to those in the stent group before they had return of their chest pains. And so that's quite incredible. And um, this is not so useful from a personal perspective, but certainly at a government level, this is quite interesting, uh, is that it was cheaper in the long run to put people with chest pain on exercise program um, than having a stent done. Um, and the price difference was quite significant. It was almost double the price over the course of a year to get a stent done, um, including all the complications and follow on from the stent and whether the chest pains returned compared to the group that just got exercise and any follow up and complications they had from doing their exercise. And so basically what they said was that to gain um, one level of, cardio, of the Canadian Cardiovascular Society uh, class, which is a measure of improvement, uh, a measure of function, but to gain an improvement in one class, um, almost 7,000 American dollars was spent in the stent group, whereas only three, uh, just under three and a half was spent in the training group. And that included all the costs of training, the equipment, the staff, um, getting people in and out. Um, so really quite an incredible uh, feat. So exercise is better than stenting in suitably selected people with stable heart disease. Now, how about for other factors? Well, physical activity and longevity. Um, we know from studies that women who don't exercise much, who are sedentary, they have a greater than five times risk of dying compared to fit women. And that men who are sedentary have a greater than three times risk of dying compared to fit men. And that every little bit counts. Um, if we have a look here, um, that most gains were made when people moved from the low fit to the mo uh, moderately fit. Um, and that from the moderately fit to the high fit, there was additional gains, but it wasn't as great. Um, and so the ch changing simply from being a low fitness category to a moderate fitness category decreases death rate by over 50%. That's right. So changing from being unfit to just moderately fit. So you don't have to be a triathlon just have to be moderately fit, will decrease your death rate by more than 50%. So, so definitely every little bit counts. Now, what is moderate physical activity? Uh, well, when someone is doing moderate physical activity, they should be able to speak, but they cannot sing. So if you're like the gentleman over here who is 
um, it looks like he's walking, but he's singing as he's doing his exercise. He's not working hard enough. But if you're like this other chap here who's straining himself so much he can barely speak, uh, he can just grunt, then uh, he's he's exerting himself too hard. That's not moderate physical activity. Um, so it's this couple over here that can chat while they're doing a light jog. Perfect. That's what we're after. So from an activity perspective, what counts as moderate physical activity? Well, here is where it's really interesting because we often think of doing structured sports classes and exercises and uh, spin classes and gym. Uh, but in fact, there are many different types of activity that count as moderate physical activity. You do not have to go to the gym or do sports necessarily. Um, also, although certainly they, they have their benefits. So gardening, various form of gardening activities count as moderate physical activity. For instance, digging raking raking the leaves weeding mowing the lawn housework so washing the floor washing the windows making the bed even um, these all count as moderate physical activity um, and obviously from a sports perspective cycling hiking and skipping although skipping is sort of moving up there into the um almost into the uh, high uh, intensity physical activity now um, as we shared before, um, does it make a difference to increase your intensity? Absolutely it does. And definitely if you have the ability, the harder you push, the more intense you do, um, the better it will be for you. And so that's what we're seeing here, that every little bit counts, that as we move up the intensity, um, it, um, from one's the lowest intensity, five's the highest intensity, the relative risk of heart attack drops significantly and it drops all the way through now um, talking about housework we saw some evidence before but who likes housework here does anyone like housework so while it sometimes it feels like a bit of a chore um, certainly there are health benefits to doing housework and so this study looked at uh, women and housework and also breast cancer and so the on average the premenopausal women did about 17 and 0.7 hours of housework and postmenopausal women did about 16 hours of housework and what we see here is that um, for those with housework activity compared to those who did uh, none or no activity um, that those who were premenopausal had a um, almost a 30% drop in their risk of breast cancer just by doing housework. And those who are postmenopausal, um, while their drop wasn't as significant, it was still almost a 20% drop. A 20% drop in breast cancer compared to those who didn't do housework. Incredible. Just doing housework, you know, something that we think is a chore, can give us health benefits. Now, physical activity. Um, obviously has an impact on the mood and we talk, touched on that um, briefly last year when we did through the online church we did the um, the depression series um, and you can find that still on the, uh, on our online Facebook web online church Facebook website it's the recordings will be there uh, but we know that sedentary men and women have um, double the risk of being depressed compared to those who are active you know active people have not only enhanced positive mood uh, because of the release of endorphins, but also it increases self-esteem um, and, and improves perception of self. It increases confidence in their performance. It helps improve coping strategies and resilience to stress. It also improves overall psychological well-being. Now, not only is it good for our mood, it's also good for our brains in other ways. We know that it helps increase uh, improve cognition and so it helps higher fluid intelligence tests and faster response times uh, it helps improve mental performance um, children and people um, school children do better on language and reading tests when they're active and it also improves short-term as well as long-term memory and it would seem to make sense when we exercise you get the blood going and that blood goes everywhere this employs blood flow everywhere just as important as um, it continues to optimize our brains and uh, not when we're young and middle age but it also continues to do so in our old age it reduces brain density loss that is associated with aging 
In fact, in some uh, in certain uh, parts of our brains, you can actually increase brain volume with exercise. That's more to do with also not just physical exercise, although that certainly helps, but also mental exercise. You know, doing um, your Sudoku or your crosswords. Um, it delays onset of dementia, including Alzheimer's, and it helps improve neural and cognitive function. In fact, physical activity. Um, does so much compared on as well as mental activity um, has such an impact on our brains that one of the leading researchers in Alzheimer's um, had this statement to make physical activity mental activity and social activity can prevent against dementias and lead to a healthy brain and heart now at this point um, I'm gonna um, change uh, tempo a little and have a talk about this chap so this chap for those who don't know his name is uh chin chi huang so he's a one of the he was the first emperor of china first in that he wasn't the first king to rule but he was the first one to unite multiple factions through war and unite bring china into one country very similar to modern day china in terms of its organization um he's probably more famous for one of the things he did, which was to link all the different parts of the Great Wall of China and to unify it into one big structure. Um, so he's famous for doing that. Um, and he's also probably most famous for his tomb, the Terracotta Warrior. That was Qin uh, Shi Huangdi's tomb. Now, what might be less well known is that um, although the, his uh, terracotta uh, warrior tomb hints at it, is that he was really fearful of death and dying. And he really, really wanted to live forever. And so what he did was when he consolidated the country and he had set up his empire and his kingdom, um, then one of the first things he did after that was he got one of his advisors his name was Xu Fu and what he did was he sent him out with a, a team to look for the elixir of immortality because he didn't want to die now that I've set myself up now I'm the ruler of the middle kingdom now that I've taken you know I, I rule this huge vast area um, I want to live forever now Xu Fu obviously had a difficult task because um, you know in this particular um, emperor had was known for not having a particularly good temper, um, and uh, and when he got upset at you, um, often the end result would be the head would be taken off, and so therefore he wanted to make sure he stayed on his right side. So he so he earnestly looked for many many years. Um, he even um, and you know he even crossed the seas and he went looking, um, and finally after many many years of searching without success, he returns to the emperor. And so the emperor's response was, do you have the elixir? He goes, uh, no, sorry, we didn't find it. Oh, why did you come back? Uh, thankfully, he was quite quick thinking and he said, look, we saw a, actually a giant sea creature and we didn't have any archers on our boat, so we couldn't cross. Okay, sure. Well, here's your archers. And so he thought, okay, we better do something. So Straight away, he set out again with his archers and shot, shot, and killed. Look, look I've, we've killed the giant sea creature. Now we're, we're now we're good to go. And so then he um, he decided to prepare for his second journey to look for the elixir of life. But being a smart person, he decided this time he wasn't coming back. He was not going to come back to Qin Shi Huangdi. And so this time, what he asked for was he asked for three thousand young boys, three thousand. Uh, 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 young girls, virgins, uh, just so that we can appease whatever it is that we come across so that we can um, get the elixir of life. Um, and so um, having gotten permission from Qin Shi Huangdi, he set out with this vast um, congregation of, of children, of, um, of uh, stewards, of, of soldiers. Um, and so then they traveled east and after a while they hit land and there he set up his new empire. Um, and so, and legend has it that Shu Fu was the, became the first emperor of Japan.
Now, people's fascination with living forever didn't just end with Qin Shi Huangdi. In fact, from time immemorial, people have always been fascinated and wanted to live forever. And this continues to this day. This is Alcor, one of um, a number of companies that um, invests in cry uh, cryonics. The freezing of people in the hope that one day medicine will advance so much that we can bring them back from the dead and help them live forever. If you have a look there, it says Life Extension Foundation since 1972. So, you know, so, some modern day Xing Chi Huang Di's, you want to live forever. Now, unfortunately, at this point in time, when I talk about this, I cannot tell you um, how to live forever from a scientific perspective. Uh, but uh, there is very good evidence on how we can live longer and live longer in a healthy way. And so that's what I'm going to present today. What is the best predictor of longevity? It is cardiorespiratory fitness. Now, to explore this concept, we're now going to have a look at um, uh, three concepts. We're going to look firstly at VO2 max. Um, so this is um, cardiorespiratory fitness is measured by VO2 max. And what this is, is the oxygen use of the large muscle groups in our body when we're working at maximal intensity. And this number is a biomarker for health. Now, guess what improves VO2 max? You guessed it, what we're talking about today, exercise, both aerobic and weight-based training, or what sometimes we refer to as resistance training. Now, VO2 max is a function of your heart and lung function, and also your muscles' ability to use oxygen. And your muscles' ability to use oxygen is determined by your mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of your cells. The more mitochondria you have, um, the better uptake of oxygen. Now, um, I'm going to come back to that. Uh, what is interval uh, training? That's something else I want to have a look at. It's a time-efficient uh, way to get good results. Uh, and what is it? What is it? It's where someone does physical activity with timed intervals of different intensities done in the same session. So what does it, what do I mean by that? It means that someone would go jogging, for instance, and they would jog for um, 15 seconds flat out, a sprint, followed by um, 30 seconds a, a gentle jog. And then again, 15 seconds flat out sprint and then again another two minutes of gentle jogging so cycles of high intensity can, uh, and then a lower intensity now the um, it may be quite intense um, but the changes in intensity doesn't have to always be flat out or maximum it can be between um, as long as there's a difference in intensity um, and the increase in intensity should be done gradually uh, but what's really interesting is that this idea of interval training um, um, sometimes it's also called high intensity interval training or HIIT. Um, studies have shown that it actually really helps in terms of improving performance quickly. In fact, one study found that um, the, the, we could, the participants could achieve the same fitness level by doing interval training compared to endurance training. Uh, they could achieve the same result but do 90% uh, less total training time. So that's incredible. High intensity interval training or interval training. How much exercise do I need? Um, well, this is the cost of the fountain of youth. You know, um, the current American guidelines, and these are the same as the Australian guidelines. Um, currently, the recommendation is for 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity activity per week or 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous intensity activity per week. So it's actually not a huge amount. So if you're doing aiming for the bare minimum of 150 um, minute, minutes of moderate intensity, that's only half an hour, five days a week. It's not even uh, seven days a week. Half an hour, five days a week of moderate intensity. So just going for a walk. Um, there is evidence to show that more is better. Um, and in fact, um, up to five hours per day. Now, obviously, most of us won't be able to train. So five hours uh, yeah, up to up to about um, uh, let's see, if, yeah, up to, you can um, double those again. So you can up to six hundred minutes per week. Um, so um, that's 
yeah, 600 minutes per week, up until that level, um, you're still going to have benefits, but um, you can't overdo it. If you go too much beyond that, um, the benefits are lost. So we want to do um, um, the the activity where it's moderate to vigorous intensity. And we co commonly would call that an aerobic type activity. Uh, but at the same time, we also want to strengthen our muscles. So we want to do resistance training at the same time of moderate to vigorous intensity. And we want to do that at least twice a week. Now, as part of all of this, um, obviously, it's also important to do warm ups and cool down. And so it would be important to bring and prepare your body um, for movement. And so the best way to do that, it should take about five minutes. Uh, usually five minutes is enough. Um, but a good way to do that um, is just to do something gentle where you're moving all your limbs that you're about to exercise. So if you're going to go for a jog, maybe going for a brisk walk or a very, very light jog so that you can get the blood flowing through your muscles. And same with your, your if you're doing weight training, just to do the same thing just to um, do some exercises to move your arms and, uh, and, to, uh, and to get the blood flowing. Now, um, what's really important with um, the warm-up and warm cool-down is that it is not necessarily stretching. And in fact, um, certain studies would suggest that you should avoid stretching until after your exercise um, because stretching your muscles before you exercise them sometimes leads to poorer performance. So stretching afterwards is good. Uh, and, flex and it's really important to stretch. Um, that's a different part of physical activity and really important for maintaining flexibility, uh, but best done after you've warmed up your muscles um, and after your activity. Now, um, this week we're going to do a shorter presentation, but there is some homework I want you to do. And so what is this homework? Um, I want you to try to in uh, put into your life some form of activity. Um, so hopefully it's whether it be jogging or cycling, whatever it is that you want to do. Uh, it would hopefully be uh, of a moderate intensity, but try to see if you can slowly build up to that 150 minutes per week. Um, and so the way we can set this uh, homework is by following this very simple uh, framework for us to plan out what we're going to do. It's called FIT. What does it mean? It stands for frequency. How frequently can I do I want to exercise in this coming week? Uh, the intensity, do I want to go for uh, just moderate intensity or do I, am, I, am I really keen to go and going to do some really intense activity? Um, what type of activity are you going to do? Are you going to go cycling? Are you going to go jogging, swimming? Are you going to um, do weight training? Um, and also timing. So time is not just um, how long you're going to do it for, but actually what time of the day, how, how I'm going to structure it and fit it into my schedule. Um, often not mentioned is the E, um, which is um, try to do something you enjoy. If you don't enjoy it, um, the chances of you continuing on with this is very low. Um, activity should be something that you enjoy doing. That's probably the most important thing. So um, that's the homework that I'd like encourage you to have a look at uh, and th do this week. And hopefully you, when we touch base next week, you'll have uh, put into practice some of these things. Now, I'm also mindful that there is... Um, uh, COVID um, around the world. In Australia at the moment, we seem to be in a fortunate position where we've got it uh, reasonably under control. Um, and, uh, uh, but overseas, this may not be the case. But um, even so, uh, within the rest uh, restraints of social distancing and what you're allowed to do, see if you can include some sort of um, exercise, even if it's indoors within the house. And so um, as we conclude today, um, I just want to remind you that you know, um, the fountain of youth is activity and that doing cardio-based activity is definitely well worth it. It helps decrease your overall risk of death um, and even moving from not exercising to a moderate amount of activity. That's all you need to get heaps and heaps of benefit. So I'd highly encourage you to put that into practice. As we close now, um, we're going to just close our eyes and say a word of prayer. Um, dear Father in heaven, Lord, as we um, bring today's talk to an end, Lord, we just want to ask that you will um, help us to know how with wisdom uh, be able to put into practice within the uh, restraints of the COVID restrictions and within um, 
uh, restraints of time and life, um, how it is we might be able to put some uh, activity into our life. And so, Lord, we just know that we just want to thank you, Lord, for learning that, Lord, this is what you've always intended for us to be, to be active people. And that, Lord, this is for our blessing and that, Lord, uh, that we can indeed have many health benefits from doing this. Help us to be able to have with wisdom, know how to best fit this into our time. Um, that, Lord, we might be able to experience the joy of being active as you intended for us to have this. Thank you, Lord, for hearing this prayer. We ask this in your Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. So as we finish today, I um, just want to um, uh, give um, some people uh, some heads up about some things that are happening. So uh, we have a sister group called uh, We Explore, uh, and this is based in Melbourne. Uh, but I highly encourage those that who in mental resilience or who are just feeling stressed at the moment because you know obviously there's been a lot of stress going around this world especially over these last 40, um, 12 to 14 months um, that um, this is a small group study that will be done online via zoom that looks at a depression anxiety its causes and the lifestyle factors that can be done to help mitigate these and to help manage them um, it does not really important is this is a general health talk and it doesn't certainly doesn't replace um, the your your physician or a psychologist or psychiatrist and it certainly doesn't replace your medications if you're on that um, but certainly we would encourage you that for those who are interested in this area um, this is an excellent program now it's based on the Neil Nedley depression and anxiety recovery program and it, um, I've sat through a number of these workshops um, and it's excellent stuff, very scientific, and it actually follows along the same lines as what um, the online church has presented previously on depression and anxiety. So certainly, if this is um, something that you're interested in, I would highly encourage you to sign up. This is the small group practice, putting into practice um, and consolidating the learning that um, we previously presented in our five-part talk on depression. It starts on Tuesday, 2nd of March, um, and it's, it will be at 7 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. 7 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. That is the, um, uh, the daylight saving Australian Eastern Standard Time. Uh, re um, registration is essential, uh, mainly because um, for some of the people, because this will be a small group discussion um, led by um, people who have had training in this area, um, um, we just need to make sure that the group gels and so therefore um, registration is essential. So you can book online at weexplore.com.au or you can WhatsApp the number there that is on the screen. Now, I've kept today's session deliberately a little bit shorter uh, because there's a lot more to talk about next week and I didn't want to go overboard with our time. But I'd really encourage you to come back. This is the chat with Dr. John Turner. This is how I looked at 67. This is how I looked at 79. And even as a 79 year old, I'd say he'd look more buff than some people who are people half his age. If you want to know his secret, join us next week as we do part two of The Fountain of Youth. How to stay young and um, not just at a skin deep level, but on our insides, muscularly, um, if physically, um, how we can stay young doing all of that. So please join us again next week as we look at part two of the Fountain of Youth on Online Church. Thank you once more. And um, as we conclude, yes, God indeed has provided for all our needs at creation. Thank you.